What's up all my unconventional people out there? I got Kara Gray with us here today and she is a professional retirement coach. People maybe think like, why would I need a coach to retire? Well, a lot of people work at these large institutions and it's their whole identity throughout their entire career. And then they finally leave corporate America or sell their business and then they get out into retirement world and they have a complete loss of identity. And that's what Kara helps people out with is figuring out what their new identity is going to be in retirement and how to make sure that they don't become depressed, sad, and ultimately lose that joy for life that they had during their working years and be able to enjoy their golden years. So happy to have Kara on. And I was always curious, how how did you stumble across this problem and figure out that, hey, this is something I can actually build a business around to help people once they leave the corporate grind. Sure. Um, So thank you for having me on the podcast. First of all, I appreciate the time and being here with you. Um, How did I stumble upon this? Well, I myself am getting older. Um, I'm 53. I'm not quite retirement age yet, but I am fascinated with the idea of really living life with purpose. I think that a lot of us during the pandemic had kind of a reckoning with what we were doing with our lives, for lack of a better word. And um, that's the time when I really started to think about this business and think about living life really well. And I didn't want to be just a regular old life coach. Not that there's not fabulous life coaches in the world, but I thought that having a specific niche was a smart move. And as we know, um, there's 11,000 people in the United States turning 65 every single day for the next three years. So from a white space standpoint, uh, you know, I saw a business opportunity as well, but I really love this idea of helping people uncover what's going to give them passion and purpose um, in their lives. Because, you know, when you retire, you may still have 30 or 40 years left. Um, And I don't look at retirement as any kind of slowing down. I think it's a massive opportunity to explore something new especially if you've planned well financially for that, which you've helped your clients do. So, you know, they got money in the bank and then now it's really time to, I mean, it's it's an opportunity. It's a huge opportunity that some people miss to really take a pause and do some thinking, do some work and come up with a plan, a design essentially for the rest of their lives, because it can be something different. It can be new things to explore. Totally. And it's so important what you said first is you have a gift to help people. However, you have to make sure that there's actually people out there that need your help, because if you're too specific in something, you have the best idea in the world. But unfortunately, if there's not people out there who require your services, then ultimately that's not a business you want to start. So you did the research. A lot of people are retiring, uh, especially the older generation, like those late boomers, essentially, who had the normal job. Some of them have pensions still. Some of them worked and made a lot of money. Now they have a lot of money and they have all of this time on their hands and they don't know what to do with it because they've carved out this corporate identity and it doesn't translate to who they want to be in retirement. So could you talk a a little bit about that? Sure. Um, Identity is a huge thing. And I think the bigger the job that people have, or if they're a business owner, I think it's even more problematic because their work really was their world or is their world. You know, I mean, it's giving them a sense of identity. It's giving them relationships. It's giving them community. um, It's giving them purpose. um, You know, it's lighting them up in ways, presumably that they, you know, they're doing things that they love to do. And then when that's over, it can be really devastating. Um, You know, some people have retirement, they have it figured out, they're looking forward to it, they have plans. Um, But some people, you know, and I think especially C-suite types or folks who are business owners, um, you know, they don't even have time to think about what the next step, what what their next chapter is going to look like. So um, that's where I come in. And I really work with my clients to identify what are those things that they loved about their job? What are those things? Like, did they love kind of mentoring younger employees? Did they like standing up and giving all hand speeches? Did they, 
you know, what were the things or what are the things that they're doing currently that they want to still experience after they sell a business or after they retire from a corporate job? And then we work to identify what some replacements might be for that um, in retirement. You know, it might be mentoring, it might be volunteering, um, depending upon, you know, if it's a family business and they sell for a lot of money, it might be starting a foundation. And, um, you know, there's, I have resources for that. You know, you don't have to do all the work, like having a foundation can be a really fulfilling thing to do, or it might be, um, it might be starting another business. Quite honestly, like I said, this is not a time to slow down in my mind at all. It's just a time to pivot and do something maybe more meaningful, maybe something that's more purposeful than what the bulk of your career was, something that's making a difference. Um, for example, um, I know somebody, I um, actually interviewed him on my podcast, um, who you know had a family-run business, ended up selling it to Xerox. And then he and a partner founded a brand new company that um, developed solar panels, and they focused specifically on employing formerly incarcerated workers. So like there's an opportunity for something like that, something to really make a difference in the world. So, you know, I mean, that's not for everyone either, but I do push my clients generally in that direction. And there's been a lot of... Um, books written, The Second Mountain by David Brooks really speaks to this, where this time in your life can really be something that's giving more meaning and more back to the world and then more fulfilling for you even personally. Totally. And people don't realize when you retire, you could be retired for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, yeah. depending on how good your health is. And when you're managing your money, you need to make sure you're accounting for that because it's not just like retire at 60 and you only got a few years left like people did a few generations ago. Now you literally have a whole new life to live. And from your experience working with people who have struggled with this, what are the possible ramifications that you've seen if they don't have all of this covered? So yeah, the biggest thing um, that happens is there's a retirement announcement. People know you have retired. Suddenly, people are asking you to volunteer for things. And they're asking you to be on maybe some nonprofit boards. And they're asking you to maybe spend a lot of time babysitting your grandchildren. Do you want to be doing any of these things? And the risk is if you haven't taken time to purposefully plan and be intentional about how you're going to spend your time, you can get sucked into all kinds of obligations that you don't really want to be doing. I mean, now is the time to really experience freedom. And so it's, you know, some people, a lot of people fall into that trap or they fall into a trap where they have no plan at all. And like, it becomes a crisis. I mean, I have had clients who are in crisis mode and, you know, really don't know what to do with themselves or their time because it's, it's such a shock. Like you don't know it until you're in it. Um, so that is also why ideally um, you start a plan a couple years before you retire. Now, that doesn't happen um, all the time. And in my case, my clients have uh, admittedly mostly come to me after they find themselves in a, a space that feels really bad for them. So it's about then helping them kind of rediscover and um, pilot some new ideas and prototype some different things to try out. Yeah, because even if you're not retired, you can only travel so much. You can only play sports so much. Your body can only take so much. And those things take a mental and physical toll on you. And ultimately, unless it's like a passion, such as maybe you were a college golfer, but you weren't good enough to go pro, you're like, hey, I'm going to try and qualify for like the senior U S open or have some sort of long-term goal to go after. But a lot of people don't have that and family is important, but ultimately you, if you don't want to babysit your grandchildren, you know, 25 hours a day, eight days a week, because right. you don't want to, cause you want to, you know, reap what you sowed working your entire life. I could see how that could be a, a huge dilemma for people and almost like freak out and, how have you seen that affect people in a negative way? Well, um, as I mentioned, you know, this this happens where you end up feeling obligated to do things 
that you don't want to do. Um, so, you know, you think you have all the time in the world, you're retired. Like, of course, you say yes to things because you don't have a plan. And then ultimately you end up, um, you know, in, in a space doing things you don't want to do and not really living life for yourself, um, which it really needs to be. And and boundaries are another big thing that, um, you know, if you've had a really structured corporate life and, you know, there's been guardrails the entire time um, in, in terms of all aspects of your life, when those aren't there anymore, that's something that can be problematic as well. And you need to learn how to put up those boundaries um, with people with organizations um, and just be, I think the word intentional sums it up the best, like being really intentional and thoughtful about how you're spending your time because it's yours. You've earned it. Why do you, why do you think some people are scared to put up that boundary to say no to certain things? I, I just don't think they've had practice doing it. Um, like I said, you know, in their corporate world, probably those things were in place, like they were natural boundaries. And so it's kind of a, a new skill you have to learn even to, to put up, um, to, to, to know, to recognize that you need boundaries in your life. Some people may feel like they're being selfish in that instance when they're saying no, how would you reframe that for someone who would potentially work with you? Um, you know, I mean, yeah, that's very much because like if you have like a daughter and maybe you feel a little guilty because like you worked a big job and you did miss certain things and now you want to attempt to get that time back, which you you can't, but you can be like, listen, I'm going to be present for them now. But at the same time, though, now you're not taking care of yourself, which could spiral into a huge uh, fallout within a family. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think it's just, again, being being clear about how you want to spend your time. And yeah, I mean, certainly those kind of things, spending time with family is part of it, but you have to have like, like I work with my clients to one of the exercises we do is plan out an ideal day in retirement, an ideal week in retirement. So think about how many hours you generally want to spend with family and then communicate that clearly to your family so that then that can be honored. And then you have time to do other things as well. It's not like you can't, not like you have to say no to everything, certainly. And like you said, family is important. Um, but I just think sometimes, you know, folks get too wrapped up in that and say yes too much and then end up not doing things that they that really bring them joy in their lives. Other things that bring them joy. Yeah, those other things can be really important. And having, you can have balance now. You can have balance yeah. in your life versus when you have a job. And especially if you are in a high paying position, you are not allowed to say no in a lot of situations. And now you have the ability to, but that muscle of saying no has almost been taken away from you. And now it's almost, how do you teach someone to get the power back? The power of saying, you know what? I know this is a great cause for this 5k for this cause, but you know what? I don't want to do that. (laughs) Well, uh, I, I mean, I just think it's got to be practiced. It's something that needs to be a acknowledged and then be practiced. Like it's not a skill that comes naturally, especially if you're used to saying yes in your career, your entire life, which most of us are like, it's kind of a yes culture. Um, but I, I do think that, um, the pandemic for all of us, not just people who retired did kind of turn on this light bulb with really, how do we want to spend our time? Who do we want to spend it with? Where do we, you know, where, where do we want to go? Where do we want to live? Like, why, you know, why are, you know, why are we doing what we're doing? Um, So I think at a cultural moment that, you know, that we've lived through, I think that that's also opened up the idea of being more thoughtful and intentional, um, certainly with who we spend our time with. For sure. And some people may be listening like, well, I'm not a C-suite executive. I'm not a practicing doctor. I'm not someone who was in that position that really carved out who my identity is. I see it a lot with uh, people who are in the space such as sciences, engineering, computer programming. What about someone who just has like a, maybe like a teacher or someone who has a 
not as like a high stress job being in like a C-suite or in like a CEO position, but someone who's like a teacher for 40 years. Have you ever experienced like how having them have an identified crisis as well? Because for me, this is for everyone, but some people might say like, well, like, you know, I'm just a teacher. Like, why would this help me? Yeah, I mean, it it might be for everyone, but I also think that um, in a career like teaching, like you're used to having summers off or bigger breaks. And mm -hmm. I think that boundaries and balance are more baked into careers like that. I'm not saying it wouldn't be difficult for somebody to not have that identity still um, and to figure out ways to use um, those skills moving forward. But I think that um, it's, I, you know, and I don't, I don't want to diminish anybody's experience. No, we're not teacher. diminishing. It's just like some people be like, you know, like I'm not a, you know, I've, yeah, I've been, but generally I, I think I was a stay at home mom, mom. Like how could this possibly help me? I was just a mom. Like that's not a, job. well, I think that's huge because when you have, you know, at a certain point, a stay at home mom is going to have an empty nest. So mm -hmm. that's a massive identity crisis and that can coincide with retirement. So that is really um, taking a look and thinking about what are those things that I've always been curious about? Is there anything unfinished that I've always wanted to do? Um, what, what are those things? Like, what did I always dream about doing as a child that I've never had a chance to explore or do? I mean, it's those kind of questions that everybody at this transition phase needs to start asking themselves. Um, because again, it's an opportunity for everyone. Like, retirement is a massive opportunity and potentially a lot of years. Right. And since you are working with people who are either entering or in retirement, a lot of the financial advisors out there are uh, older people and they yes. don't really have these conversations with these clients because the old school financial advisor, not all of them, but a lot of them are more salesy, old school, you know, Hey, Kara, I got you to 4 million. You're good. You can do whatever you want. Like just, you know, I'm going to send you this much money a month, but that's a very shallow conversation. How can financial professionals start having a more impactful conversation with their clients to help them not only enjoy the money that they've saved, but also to ensure that they don't have a, <laughs> a freak out. <laughs> For sure. And that has been surprising to me as I've entered into this field of work that I have encountered a lot of older financial advisors who are, are not thinking about this, are not thinking about their clients' lives holistically at all. They're completely focused on the money. And so, uh, I mean, I applaud you. We've had great conversations about how this is important and how it can be a differentiator in your business. Um, I just think that's highly attractive when looking for a wealth advisor to work with somebody who takes into account the big picture. I mean, it can't just be about money. It also has to be about um, what you're going to do with your time and how you're going to live a fulfilling life. So, um, yeah, I think um, I remember where I was going with this. Um, I <laughs> so like, what, what can like people like myself start doing to be more proactive oh, yes. about this? Absolutely. I mean, I think that you need to straight out ask your clients, like, do you have a plan for what you're going to do in retirement? Um, probably nobody has ever asked them like specifically, you know, like, and, you know, and not just like, I'm going to spend time with the grandkids and we're going to travel more. That's not it. Um, that's going to get old quickly, especially if you got 30 more years to go. You know what? You really need to, um, They, I mean, they really need to have a plan for how they're going to keep learning, how they're going to stay relevant. Um, the identity piece is huge depending upon the person. Like, you know, it's it, like I said, it's harder for some people than others. Um, but it's more than that. It's a plan also, you know, I look at my clients' physical health and mental health and relationships and do they have community do they need to find you know more groups of people do they need to join a book club because their community is entirely at the office right now like their entire social circle is at the office 
do they, you know, do, do they need to join a pickleball league? I mean, it's off, awfully popular. It's, and it's a social and it's physical health and it's, you know, it's great for building friendships and relationships are, do you need to expand your circle of friendships? Um, you know, there's lots of things that people aren't considering. So I think maybe having a checklist as a financial planner, if you're comfortable having that type of conversation with your clients, I think it's good just to get their wheels turning, if nothing less, and then maybe have some um, resources for them, like, you know, a, a couple books to read or, you know, something that gets the wheels turning a little bit, because a lot of people just aren't even taking time to really think about how challenging this phase of life might be. Mm -hmm. There's so many things as a financial professional that financial professionals ignore, such as you're going to lose clients just because of time and things are going to happen. How are you going to handle that? How are you going to walk someone through where if they get diagnosed with an illness and it's terminal, how are you going to handle that situation, meeting with them to talk about handling everything, not just about protecting the money and making sure the money is going where it needs to be, but ultimately being that friend, not not just a financial professional, but basically being a friend in a time of need to help someone through that sort of situation. And I definitely believe that's where the financial industry is missing. And that is definitely something that if done correctly and just being a person, like I'm just a person. Yeah. You're just a person like Warren Buffett is just a person. Bill Gates is just a person. We're all just people. So just being a person when someone you've worked with for 30 years is going through something and being there for them yep. at a different level. And I feel like that's where the ball is being dropped. Yeah, I haven't experienced this myself, but I would agree that um, I'm, I'm guessing that this happens. It is being a human being. and. You know, I mean, I think being a human being, being there, staying close enough to your clients so that you understand when some kind of crisis is happening, um, and then offering them some resources, having resources in your pocket that you can point them to, um, whether it's, you know, they need an estate planner or they're thinking about legacy or, you know, they need help designing the rest of their life. Um, you know, there's many ways that you can be really helpful to them and they 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 probably aren't expecting that from you. So it's just massive value add that you're giving to your clients. Yeah, because you can be really good at your investment strategy and coming up with a great game plan and you can do all of this. Now we're on to something cool, which I like to ask, like, are you, have you thought about like focusing on like or writing a book or something like this? Because this is something that, Eventually, it's going to hit mainstream. And once it does, it could be very powerful for people to have. Have you thought about like doing something like that? I have. Um, as I briefly mentioned, I host a podcast as well where I help people or where, where I interview people who have successfully transitioned to into whatever their next chapter is going to be. I call it Act Three. That's the name of my pod or yeah, the name of my podcast. And I thought about... Um, you know, sh using some of that material to shift into a book. I think there's space for it, but I do think a lot of people are starting to talk about this space and writing about it. And there's even, um, there's even courses at major universities now where people can pay and it's a lot of money, like 70, 80 grand to go back to school for a year to figure out what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. I'm not even kidding you. It's at Notre Dame and Stanford and Harvard and Oxford, um, University of Chicago just started one. Like this is something that's just been catching on the last few years. So there's starting to be a lot of movement in this space. Um, and then there's also this group um, called the Modern Elder Academy. And they also do like big retreats where they're helping people kind of you know, search these big life questions and figure out what's next. I mean, I, I think you should come and work with me. It's a lot cheaper, but. <laughs> well, it's more um, affordable, but like, what is the different differentiator between me just being like, I went to Notre Dame, I'm going to give Notre Dame my money as an alumnus versus working with someone who's more independent like you. Like, because some people are like, well, there's more risk of working with someone who's independent versus going with like a household name. I look at the, like, look at it on the flip side is like, well, the independent person actually probably cares a lot more than a, 
a large institution. <laughs> Yeah, I I care a lot. I get very invested in my clients' success um, and success as defined with, you know, having a really fulfilling plan with what they're going to do for the rest of their lives. Um, But what I, another reason to work with, you know, somebody individually is that everything that I do is completely custom. So I focus on what, you know, what gaps my clients have in their world. And again, I'm talking about physical health, mental health, relationships, community, um, identity, purpose. Like we we benchmark all of that at the start of our work together. And then we see where there's gaps. And that's where I focus my practice to move the needle on some areas where they need the most help. And so all of my work is built, like we have a session and then what I give them as homework for the next session is built off of what we talked about or where there's still problems that we need to solve and and gaps that exist. Um, so I think that working with me is going to be much more custom or is going to a university program is, I mean, you're going to have the community and the experience of going, you know, going through this process with other people who are in the same boat. And I think there's value in that. Um, but if you want something that's going to be specific to you, that's what I do. Are you working towards getting something like more group oriented to bring people into your community? Has that been a thought or something you're working towards? So, there's a thought of that, although most of the folks that I work with tend to like the individual attention. But um, recently I met with a group of retired military, mm. and that is also a very interesting area. And that gave me a lot of like real inspiration. I mean, folks that have served like 20 years overseas and are now coming back, and they're certainly not ready to retire, retire, sit on the couch, take care of grandkids. They're they're pretty young still, but it's a huge transition. And so that um, in that scenario, I think that a cohort is really could work really well and does work really well. I actually joined another program of a gentleman who has, um, you know, that in motion and he meets with a few different groups of retired military every week. Um, and he had me as a guest one time and I, I found, you know, that that works really well. So I think there may be potential to do more kind of group work in that type of a setting. Um, but I think you would have to find, you know, like military was a good example. I think you need to find a group of people who are have come from the same experience. And that's the way that like group work would work well. When you're planning for your future, you can't do the same things that got you to this to this point in time. You definitely have to transform yourself and take what you did to get you here at the same time, doing the same thing that you did in your corporate life versus retired life, that would be act three. And you have to have a different act because if I go to a play and act one, act two and act three are all the same, it's going to be a crappy play. That's right. (laughs) And I think you hit on something too, like retirement, it's, it's hard because you're a beginner again, if that makes sense. Like I work with my clients to uncover new things that they want to explore. I mean, they might be using the same skill sets that they've been using um, throughout their career, but it's going to be something new. And that takes a kind of openness and vulnerability um, that not everybody is comfortable with. So that's something, and and it, it's, it's absolutely essential to get through this and come out on the other side in a positive place. Like you have to embrace that beginner's mindset again and be willing to try things that are going to feel uncomfortable and to, you know, be open to new experiences and growing. Because the thing is, if you don't, your world just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's really, you know, it's not a great way to live, but a lot of people do live that way. Um, But that's like the tragedy that I want to help people avoid, because I think that life can just get more expansive the older we get instead of a retraction. And that's, you know, what I encourage. And I think, um, you know, certainly being open to being a beginner, trying new things and learning is really important. Staying open to staying current with things and learning. Um, I have a client right now and a big part of what, you know, what he's going to do moving forward is he's diving into a bunch of courses on AI 
and learning about that. You know, it's going to be relevant to almost every single industry um, that we have. And so, you know, he's curious about that. He hasn't had time to explore that. And, you know, there's a million ways to explore that now. So I found some really good, um, you know, free YouTube channels, you know, online sources, and then also um, free certifications from places like IBM and Microsoft um, and Google. And there's ways to explore it. And there's also like more structured courses. And I even think Harvard has like a seven week online free course where you can really do a deep dive into AI. So it's staying curious about technology and music and art and things that are evolving and growing um, as you age. That's what can really make life worth living and continue to be feeling really vibrant and really alive. Totally. What I'm getting from that is you're helping people almost rediscover their inner child. When you're just curious about everything, you go to your first concert and then you kind of start going to the same concerts. You start go, you listen to the same music versus like, you know, I'm going to go on Ticketmaster and I'm going to see what concert this week. I had never heard of this band, but I got the money. I'm going to go and check it out and see if I like it or not. You may right. love it. You may hate it. But keeping that curiosity of keeping an open mindset on things will allow you to have those new experiences for you to enjoy in retirement. Yeah, 100%. So I think it's really cool. Appreciate you having me on, Kara. We'll see everyone next time.